Lord Jesus, we are your people who are called by your name. And then we humble ourselves and pray. We turn from our wicked ways and we seek your face and we ask you please to heal us, to heal this land. And God, all the lands that are represented here, the countries and the cities of the people who, whose hearts are partially there. The family that we have, God, we ask you please to watch over them. May your word teach us how to live. May your word teach us what's wrong with us, God. Sometimes we just can't figure out what's wrong with ourselves. So may your word give us a mirror to show us. We need you, and we're not afraid to admit we need you. In Christ's name, amen. Uh, I'd like a question answered before the service is over. I was sitting there meditating on the word of God, because I, I often do that. I'll just read something that I don't understand, can't figure out, and I just sit there and I say it over and over and over again. I say it to myself, and I just look at it and read it and read it and read it, and I guess that's what meditation is. I'm really not sure what meditation is. I've never really meditated. As a growing up, I used to think it was like some Zen thing or anything like that. I, I don't know. I really don't. But what I did do is read it over and over again and think about it a lot, and that's what I'm calling meditation. I'm going to just leave that out there. And I asked myself a question in this meditative state, and it was, why do you believe in God? And I really had to stumble on that answer for a second. Because for sure, as Christians, like, why do you believe in God? Well, if I believe in God because... Why do I believe in God? Think about that. For a minute, we'll come back to that question. About two weeks ago, we did this whole service on the surrendering of one's life, the giving of your heart to God and letting him change completely the way you think. I told this whole story about Chuck Smith pulling the carpet up because he didn't want people to feel bad about getting sand on it. If you weren't here, you missed it. Um, and it was like... I, li I actually listen to it, and I try not to listen to the messages that I preach because I hate the sound of my own voice. It's like bad. I feel sorry for you guys. When I listen to my own message, I go, oh my goodness, why does anybody show up? Oh, so bad. Actually, funny story, some 10 years ago, about four or five years into the church, I called my, my buddy Ken up. He's, a, he's my pastor up in, in Maine. I, I said, Ken, man, um, I have a problem. He goes, what's the matter? He said, um, I said to him, man, I listened to one of my messages on tape, and it's like, I'm really bad. <laughs> I mean, like, bad. He said to me, and as only Ken could say, he has this big, deep voice, and he said, Ryan, if you like the sound of your own voice, you have bigger problems than being a bad preacher. <laughs> Fair enough. And I was particularly yelly this two weeks ago. I, was, I remember I, was, I listened to it yelling, and the speakers are breaking apart. And I was like, oh, why am I yelling at these poor people for? You go, lose! Veins and everything. This service is just the opposite, guys. What's funny about this service, though, it's the exact same service. He preaches... The Apostle Paul does in chapter 10 the exact same message as he did in chapter 8. It's all about understanding that your life shouldn't be about you. It's all about understanding that thinking of others is better than thinking of yourself. It's the way to God. If you remember, I, I, always, I said this cute thing that I say all the time. Hey, the way up is down and the way down is up. And it gives you something to think, yeah, that's kind of, if I think higher myself. And here he kind of takes it light. For you who don't learn with a heavy hand, with, a, uh, with an iron fist, maybe you'll learn with just a kind word. And today I do believe this is the, the methodology chosen by the Apostle Paul in today's service. So this is the one I'm going to do. He reasons with the power of God's word. And he says, listen, why do you believe in God? Well, I came up with an answer for that question. And you know what it was? Because God's word works. And it shouldn't. 
When I was growing up, you know what my life was about? Getting mine. It was about me. Don't stand in my way because I'll cut you down. I take what I want, I have what I want, and if you stand in the way of that, you will get run over. And I didn't care, and, and I don't know what, it, it, it didn't matter whether it was my parents, it didn't matter if it was my girlfriend, it didn't, listen, mine, me, because I got to get mine. That's everything I felt, is everything I desired, is everything that I thought was going to improve my life. And you know the craziest thing? God's word says to consider others better than yourself. God says to treat others the way you want to be treated. Notice it doesn't say to treat them the way they treat you, which I like a little better because people treat you like crap, I get to treat them like crap. It says, treat them the way you want to be treated. And I love, it's not parenthetical. There's no parentheses after that says, until they treat you poorly, then you can do the same to them. It doesn't work like that. It's an ongoing. It's what's called in, in English terminology, an infinite participle, which meaning it never ends. Well, what if they treat you bad? Then treat them better. And you know what I found out the last few years? That crap works. And you want to know something? There's the answer to the question. When somebody says, hey, why do you believe in God? Because it makes absolutely no sense whatsoever, and it works anyway. <laughs> That's why I believe in God. If there's one place I've seen miracles, it's in denying myself. It's if there's one place that I've seen happiness, it's in denying myself. If there's one place that I've seen financial prosperity, it's in denying myself. Every single time I deny myself and think of others better, in the end it works out better for me. I ain't gonna let that woman talk to me like that anymore. And But when I do, it works out better. Why do you believe in God? Verse 1, chapter 10, Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea, all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank of the, that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Please, before we read verse 5, let me explain to you. He's doing an Old Testament Bible study. In case you're new to Scripture, there's two uh, testaments, so to speak. There's the Jewish Bible, which starts in Genesis and ends in Malachi. It has the law, the prophets, the Psalms, the Proverbs, the wisdom books, ending in Malachi, which is the, a minor prophet. And then you have the New Testament, which starts in Matthew and ends in Revelation. Somehow... It's an integrated message system spanning some 1,500 years of writings, um, going through all of creation, 10,000 years, and yet cohesive in its workings, non-contradictive. I've often talked to people and asked them why they don't read the Bible. Oh, well, it's full of contradictions. I was like, would you show me one of them? Well, that's what my teacher told me. Well, you know why I don't believe the Bible? Tell me. I would love to hear it. I'm very interested in why somebody wouldn't believe the Bible. So he does this Old Testament study here, which for me is a good indicator that I need to read the Old Testament. If you're here and you're a Christian and you're one of those guys that only reads the, the New Testament, I suggest you read the Old Testament. And here's one of the most amazing reasons why. You see what he said there? All of our fathers were under the cloud. If you don't know the story, it's in the book of Exodus, around the 19th chapter. The nation of Israel was delivered from Egypt. They were slaves for 400 some odd years, hard labor slaves, and they were led out by Moses into the wilderness. And some of them out in the wilderness 
They look back at their lives and say, I want to go back there. Oh, well, you brought us out in the wilderness to kill us. We hate you, Moses. We should kill you and go back. And, and God sent a cloud. And during the day, the cloud kept them from the sun. And during the night, that same cloud became a pillar of fire that led them through. And there's this amazing story in chapter 19 of the book of Exodus where Pharaoh said, you know what? Go kill all those slaves. I let them go and I shouldn't have. Some two plus million people, some would say. And he sends out his army to go and kill them. And all the people were rumbling, oh, I knew we shouldn't have came with you, you stink, and all this other stuff. And the cloud covers them. And then the cloud shifts and now goes in back of them and hides them. And there they are. On one side is the Red Sea. On the other side is the armies of Pharaoh coming to destroy them. And that's where God divided the sea. If you've never heard this story, really good movie from the, I think it's the 50s, called The Ten Commandments. Phenomenal story. They, it's not all true, but there's some really great scenes in it. Um, they, stick, they stuck fairly true to uh, the Bible as much as you can in a movie anyway. And, the, and, the, and the, the water goes up as a heap, it says, and they went through dry ground. And here he's saying, all the people, all your fathers, Jewish men, went through the sea on dry ground. And look what he says there. All were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. So he's saying that it was a particular type of baptism for the Jew. Where on one side was the old life, on the other side was the new life. You could stay back and be a slave, or you can go and walk in newness of life. But don't make any mistake about it. On your way to newness of life are going to be tough times. People who are really smart, worldly people have often asked me, hey, what happened to you, man? What, what made you become a Christian? Why would you give your life to Christ? And I've often asked other people that same question. What is it that happened in my life that made me a Christian? Well, I was brought up in a Christian family, and my mother and father were so blessed following the Lord, and worship was always playing in my house. So I thought that's the path that I should choose. So one day I decided I need forgiveness of my sins, and I started walking with the Lord. No. And I don't know too many people that's ever happened to. Do you know what my life's testimony was? Me, 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 me. Hurt as many people as I can, take from what I can, sleep with who I can, get what I got. And somehow, after all that getting, the only thing I wound up was miserable and alone and in a lot of legal trouble. If that's your life I'm describing, well, of course. Now, and the response I always get from people who I tell this to, they say the same thing to me. Well, that's why, uh, you're, you're, that's why you, I understand now why you believe in God, because you believe in God because you messed your life up. Those who haven't messed their life up don't need God. You don't. People who aren't sick don't need a doctor. And it wasn't me that said that, in case you don't know. But an interesting thing happened one day. A guy told me, no, no, let me explain how this works. God let that happen to you. God let you have legal problems. God let you have family problems. God took your brothers from you. God did all of that. Well, why would he do that? Because he wanted a relationship with you. And he knew what it would take to get you there. So you're saying all the bad things that happened to me, God did them? Yes. Well, I don't know if I'm happy about that or sad about that. I don't know if I should be mad at God for that. Why would he let bad things happen to me? Because he knew what it would take for you to get to your knees and call upon him. I, don't, I still struggle with that. And I wish I could answer that question. I wish I could, hey, let me lay out the answer to that. Let me just throw this answer out there. And you guys, oh, that's it. No, there's never going to be a time where you stop struggling with that. 
There's always going to be a time where you, you say, but God, what about what? I had two brothers that died as babies. I had one brother that died as an adult. What, why, though? Well, that's the path I chose for them. And if you wrestle your whole life with the sovereign hand of God, if you wrestle your whole life on what God did in somebody else's life, You'll never be able to give your life to God. Never. It's always going to be, well, is God good or is God not good? And that's why we have this Christian saying. For you guys that are new to Christ, watch what happens here. You guys that are seasoned saints, when I say God is good, you say? And when I say all the time, you say? That's not when God heals me of cancer. That's also when God lets you walk through the valley of the shadow of death. God's good when you win and when you lose. And that's the hardest thing for true Christians to wrap their head around. They were all baptized in that same pain. And I love what he says here in verse uh, 4. For they drank latter part of verse 4, for they drank of the spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock was Christ. You guys know the story of Moses? And the Israelites, for the tenth time, were complaining against the plan that God had for their lives. And they said, we need water. We're going to die out here. You took us in the desert to die. And Moses, he took his staff and he touched the rock and the rock split open and the water flowed from the rock. And he said, drink. Here, the Apostle Paul said that rock was Christ. And now you can start to, it opens up so many doors in your mind. For you guys that know the New Testament, wow, it does say that from his belly will flow torrents of living water. He is the spiritual drink. And, and now, wow. So now, every time I read the Old Testament, I'm looking for Christ. I want to see him in the Old Testament. Because that, to me, brings it all together. And when I could put these pictures, if, if, you, ever, if you know the story of, of, um, of uh, uh, when Abraham took his son Isaac up on the mountain, and you hear, and the ram was caught in the thicket, and he went up there to sacrifice his son, and, and you're like, man, that's crazy. Or you know the story of Moses when he put the blood on the doorposts and the lentil, and it's the same place where the, the hands and the, were pierced and the blood flowed, and you're like, man, those pictures are amazing. How did God do that? Or when, when Christ was on the cross and he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And then you read Psalm 22 and you're like, that's the same thing that David wrote. Yeah, now I know God, I know the Lord Jesus had a lot of presence of mind. He was a smart guy. But while he was being crucified to say the same thing that David wrote some 500 years before that, yeah, I don't know. There's, that's coincidence. No, no. I don't, I don't buy that. Verse 5, But with most of them, God was not well pleased, for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now these things became our examples to the extent that we should not lust after the things as they lusted. Now we have this crazy thing that happens in our day and age because we, we are so arrogant and so self-righteous. We think we got it all. Like, we're the best sex partners ever. Like, pff, nobody can do what I can do. Yeah. Listen, sex has been going on a really long time. And you ain't the best at it. As a matter of fact, you're probably not even top 20. Sisters here are like, brothers here are like, pff, just a church full of studs, aren't we? Why did I use that as an example? Because listen, listen, see what it said here? They lusted even in the wilderness, even in their deliverance, even after God delivered them. All they did was screw around constantly. Like, that's all they did. And the Lord was like, listen, you got to get control of that thing. I heard this guy talking the other day about um, people being born a certain way. Well, this person was born gay, and this person was born straight, and that person was born uh, trans, this person was born hetero. And, this, and, and I thought to myself, yeah, that can't be. You, you can't be born with proclivity for sex toward one gender or the other gender or one. 
Because sex is a choice. I was born with a proclivity to breathing. Since I was born, I don't even have to think about it. Listen, I even breathe when I sleep. Crazy? Some of you guys are really, right now, you're personally offended that I said that. No, no, you don't know, because I have a brother and he's gay. Listen, your brother chose to be gay. Just because you're turned on by something doesn't mean you have to put your thing in it. You can say no. No, I'm not going to do that. Why? Because it's not good for me. Now, I guarantee you here, there's many people who have, are married or have been married and were not virgins when you got married. But you, at this point in your life, can look at your spouse, could look at the person you love and say, you know what? I wish you were the only one I had sex with. I really do. I know I say that to my wife. Me and my wife were together for seven years before we got married. We've been married now for 25 years. We just celebrated 25 years. And it's like, you know what? Everything else before you was just stupid. I don't know why I did that. Now, at, your, at some places you guys are at right now, you don't even get that. that that's like such a far... What are you talking about? I got to get mine. Variety is the spice of life. Yeah, it is. And sex feels good, and it's fun. But it ain't good for you. Not unless you're doing it with the person you're, told you're married to. Dog, you don't know what you're talking about. No, that's the problem. I might not look like it now, but one time I was Rico Suave, man. <laughs> now I'm just Gordo Suave. <laughs> Yeah, nah. It's the craziest thing. Diseases and heartbreak and... Why does that happen, man? I'll tell you why. Because you shouldn't do everything that looks like it might feel good. <laughs> and that's another one of those answers to that question. Why do you believe in God? Because God's word is true every time. And do not become idolaters as some of them are. You know what an idol? This is always, people always idol. As soon as I say the word idols, some of you all think, you think like this little statue or something like that, and you guys go home and worship it. An idol is anything that comes before God. Like for me, what's a constant idol? Jiu-jitsu. Now I'll tell you honestly. I love jujitsu. I can live in the gym. I can, you never see me again. If I got to do what I wanted to do, I'd wake up at about 8 in the morning, I'd eat breakfast, I'd be in the gym by 10, and I, and, and I wouldn't leave until about 10 at night, I'd just go home and sleep. Get up the next morning, go do some more jujitsu. I just love it. It's my, it's my idol. I, I worship jujitsu. And I had to keep Pushing it down. No, no, you have to have a life. You got to stop. You got to spend time with your wife. You got to go watch your kids. You... And it's all my son's fault. He started me in the whole thing. <laughs> and idols are funny like that. Idols have this appearance that you're doing something right. So I started doing jujitsu because I took my son to the gym. My son really liked to play video games. And I used to tell him, okay, buddy, here's the thing. From now on, you can play video games as much as you're in the gym. I thought that would solve the problem. So he was 9, 10, 11 years old, jumping on his bike, because we homeschooled, so, and he didn't really do a whole lot of homeschooling for a while. So he would jump on his bike, go to the gym, spend three or four hours at the gym, and then come home and go, okay, I just spent three hours in the gym, so now I get to play my video game for three hours. So he got really good at jujitsu and really good at video games. <laughs> and the point I was making was, I decided I was going to be involved in my kids' lives. So if you're going to do jujitsu, about a year or so after he started doing jujitsu, I'm going to take a class. One of the guys in the gym, oh, you come in the class with me, I help you. I was like, ah, I don't do that. Rolling around on the floor with men, that's weird. <laughs> my first class, I was like, what am I doing? This is stupid. By the third class, I'm like, can I live here? Please. And that's how idols work. Hey, I'm just spending time with my son. 
yeah, your son's class ended two hours ago. Well, you know. I'll be home in a little while. So when you say idol, it's anything that stands before God. Now again, read 6 again. These things became our examples. So we read the Old Testament, and we are now supposed to apply this to our lives. We read the Old Testament and say, wow, these people struggled in this. Now watch, we're going to end in the same way. When the Bible study ends, we're going to end it in the exact same place where we're starting. Trying to read the Bible and apply what you're seeing in your life. Not everything is like, sometimes you read and it says, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. And you're like, got it. But sometimes it's like a story that you have to apply to your life. Well, they did this, and that's just like when I do that. So in case you've not read the Bible before and figured out, I don't even know what that's supposed to mean. What does that mean? Moses went up on the mountain, his face shone like the sun, he, he got Ten Commandments. What, what does that mean? I read the Bible, I don't know what it means. You don't just have to know what it means. Sometimes you just apply it. Okay, well, so that's like if Moses went up on a mountain, that means sometimes I should maybe get away and spend time with the Lord also. And my face will be radiant. Will it really be glowing? It won't really be glowing, but your, your countenance, you'll, be, you'll, you'll smile a little more. Okay, I can do that. I can apply that. These things were given as our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Ah, got it. And do not become idolaters as some of them, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Nor let us commit sexual immorality as some of them did, and in one day 23,000 fell. That's from the book of Numbers. Nor let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempt Christ, and they were destroyed by serpents. Christ, wait a second, Christ wasn't born for 4,000 years or something like that after that story. So what happens is the people are in the wilderness and they get sick and tired of eating manna. What's manna? You haven't read the Old Testament, you won't know what manna is. You've got to read manna. You've got to read about what manna is. And so they complain. They went to Moses, we're sick of this bread you gave us. We're sick of it. So God rained down on them quail. And they eat quail and they all got sick and started dying. So at one point, there's another story, they're complaining again, and God tells Moses, it's the craziest story. He says, I want you to get a pole. I want you to get a big stick, a pole, which you put in the ground, and then I want you to make a serpent, a bronze serpent. And I want you to nail it to the top of the pole. And everybody who looks to the bronze serpent will be healed. Everybody else who doesn't, dead. And at the time, you're like, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. You mean look to it. But now we have aft knowledge. We have 2020 hindsight. What he was doing, what Moses was doing thousands of years before Christ, was giving us a picture. The bronze serpent, which, by the way, if, you've, if anybody's ever seen medical um, uh, imagery, it's those two snakes that are there, that, that are in every. That's the bronze serpent. He said. Nailed to a tree, snake being a type of sin, the sin was nailed to the cross, Christ who became sin for us. Wow! That's really cool. So here, in the New Testament, he's saying, in the Old Testament, that was Christ. Some of you guys, lights are going off right now, and you're like, that's crazy. Some of you guys are like, I have no idea what you're talking about. That's okay. That's okay. Nor complain, verse 10, as some of them also complained, I'm destroyed by the destroyer. Eleven. Now all these things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our admonition. That word admonition, you could circle it if you don't know it, just flat out means your warning. This is your warning. If you screw around like they screwed around, the same thing's going to happen to you. But I thought we live in a time of grace. What you reap, you sow. You sleep around with a lot of people, you're going to be lonely in the end. Probably get a disease too. Yeah, I don't know about that. Upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Therefore, let a, him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. Listen, I love this. And this is why it's so different as it was two weeks ago. 
He says, listen, I know that maybe some of you guys don't struggle with that stuff. Some of you guys got this down. No, you're one person. I got it. And listen, don't sleep around. Got it. Don't do drugs. Got it. Don't. Do... I got that. Here he says something so interesting. And this is, this is for me. He says again, therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. He said, be careful where you think you got this thing down, Pat. Be careful. Now, guys, I've never struggled with drugs, but I stay far away from them. I never did drugs. This never was my thing. Watch where this goes from here. Please keep that somewhere. Now, this is a promise that every single person who's ever been tempted to do wrong should look to. This is a memory verse. Everybody should memorize this next verse. I've memorized it almost 20 years ago. I'll never forget it. Watch what he says here. No temptation has seized you, has taken you, except such as common to man, but God is faithful. Everybody that's here, whenever they're on the outs with God, whenever they're running from God, they always think, but you don't understand. This is what I'm going through. You don't understand. You know who does this more than anything? Sisters do this more than anything else. Sisters always think they're alone. But nobody would understand. You don't understand. Nobody's going. Listen to me. That's a lie from the pit of hell. Nothing is happening to you that doesn't happen to other people. And that is the biggest lie that the enemy comes. You know how many people don't come to church? I go to church. I'll, go. I'll, st I'll burst into flames as soon as I walk in the door. No, you won't. And if you do... You'll be amongst other people who are on fire, too. Don't worry. <laughs> oh, look at all those people. They're all happy and they got a good relationship. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just a pig. Well, we're all a bunch of dogs and pigs. It's okay. Welcome, welcome to the barn. There's no temptation to seize you, except such as common to man. What you're going through, millions and millions of other people, hundreds and hundreds, tens and tens, dozens, you're, you're all going, we're all going through it together. And listen what he continues to say here. God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able, but with the temptation will also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. That is a supernatural promise from God that you need to hold on to. Here's what he says. Listen, I know the weakness of your flesh. But nothing you're going to be tempted with, God's not going to show up. Listen, let's say you're a married man here. And you're out there, and you meet some girl, and she wants to sleep with you. And you're weak. So you kind of go in the house, and you sleep with her, and then you leave, and you feel terrible because you just cheated on your wife. Listen, don't blame God for that. God knocked on your heart a hundred times before you touched her, after you kissed her. During this, God kept offering you, come on, don't do that. Your phone rang. You got a text. Something happened to you. You got in the car with your boys, and you knew, that you knew they were going out to drink. You knew something. Oh, God always gives you the, come on, let's do this. Let's not, let's not do this. You have, to, you have to shine God off a dozen times. God always says, don't do that. Something will knock on the door. Hey, what are you doing in there? And when you look about it, it's so true. I have such, my, my brain, forgive me, but I'm doing this so that you guys understand you're not alone. No temptation to season you. My brain has these like amazing things. I have this, I, I was up in the mountains and uh, I'm on the top of a mountain with my wife. My wife's in the cabin. Baby, I'm going to go for a run. We've been eating junk food all week. I went for a run, and it's sweaty, and I took my shirt off, and I tucked him, and I'm running up the mountain. I've got, I got work boots on and, and fatigues, and I'm running. I get to the end. I'm at the end of this block. I turn around and start walking the other way, and there's a girl standing there near a pickup truck, and she's like, attractive. And she's like, hi. Hi. Sorry to startle you. She's like, it's okay. I'm just working in the cabin down there. Hi. She's like, 
can you help me move this bed out of the way? No. <laughs> Can't. Sorry. I'm going this way. There's no road that way. I'm going to jump off the mountain. <laughs> now, as, as she walks away, okay, you know, weirdo. Like in my brain, immediately, this wicked, oh man, you just had the opportunity, she'll never know. All these things. There's like, Ken Graves always says, there's like this slick New York Jewish lawyer in all our brains. <laughs> Now it's going to start reasoning with you on why you just... I mean, that's a fantasy for the ages, right? There I am, sweaty and glistening. And in my brain, like I'm sure, like I got a six-pack, you know what I mean? Here's Gordo Suave, there he is. And like in, in her, she was probably like, I just needed help moving this thinking bed. I like, and me, like, she wanted me to move that bed. I still got it. Like five minutes into the walk, five, I'm, three minutes after I saw the girl, honey, are you okay? Baby, I'm fine! <laughs> I'm fine! Fine, gotta go. See you. <laughs> because without having done it, my brain won't tell me what I already know. Wouldn't have been worth it. Nobody would have ever known. Wouldn't have been worth it. Why? Because I've been there, done that, and it wasn't worth it. Believe me when I tell you. Some of you guys are amen what I'm saying right now, and some of you guys are like, give me that same situation. Yeah, I know you think so. Until you're in that situation, your sin will always find you out, buddy. No temptation is taking you except such as common to man, but God is faithful and will offer you a way out so that you can bear up. He will always offer you out. Therefore, my beloved, verse 14, flee from idolatry. I speak as to wise men. Judge for yourselves what I say. The cup of blessings which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? Christ, the bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we, though many, are one bread and one body, for we all partake of that one bread. Let me explain to what he's saying there. Um, and this is a reference to one of the sacraments of our Christian faith. It's communion. So when we have the communion, let me explain to what originally communion was. They used to take bread. And we did this when we were a smaller church back in the old days. We used to take these pieces of bread almost like, um, what were they called? Those little flat breads? Pita. Not matzo, pita. So we used to take pita and we used to dip it in a little sop or a little like a, like a stewy soup. And that was our communion. And what it is, is all that bread was one, and we were dipping it in one. So that we would all be united as brothers and sisters, but the representation of the bread and the sop was the body and blood of Christ becoming one with him. So you want to become one with each other as you become one with Christ. And that's why we're so important, that sacrament was so important for unity. But watch what he goes on to say here. Observe Israel after the flesh, verse 18, are not those who eat of the sacrifices partakers of the altar? What am I saying then? That an idol is anything? Or what is offered to idols anything? Rather that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. And I do not want you to be, have fellowship with demons. You cannot drink of the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the Lord's table and of the table of demons. Or do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? He says, I want you to be careful in mixing with the world. You cannot be one with both. You cannot have it both ways. The biggest struggle that some of our, um, our missionaries struggle with is the, uh, the mixing of the culture. We... Um, we have a, a missionary named Paul. He's in Kenya. And he says that he's, he's over there training pastors to be... But the, the Christianity over there, it's still a mixture of voodoo. It's still a mixture of their crazy African sacrifices and dancing the demons. And, and yet they have a cross in the middle. You know what I mean? It's like you can't do that. You can't partake of both. And the application for us is kind of obvious. 
Guys, this life is a sacrifice. Let me just go back about 30 years. Man, I love having a lot of relationships with a lot of women. It ain't good. And you can't do both. You got to leave that life. But I like... Don't. You can't... You can't be smoking and drinking at night and going to church on Sunday and think that you're doing this thing right. Now, please, let me put a caveat in there. If you're new to the things of the Lord, do whatever you need to do at night. Do whatever you want to do. I don't care if you're gay, straight, whatever it is that you are. I don't care if you're a drug addict, heroin, crack. I don't care. If you're new, man, just just come here. Just come here. Let let God do the work. That's, That's fine. But at some time, you got to grow out of that stuff and go, you know what? It don't work. You can't, you can't sleep around with other girls, ladies, and then go home to your husband and think God's going to bless your relationship. If, you know, you did this, oh, well, in college I really liked, you know, so, you know that's fine. At some point in time, you got to say, it's over. Because you can't, you can't do both. Watch. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but not all things edify. Before we read verse 24, this is a crazy part that I cannot be misunderstood, but it must be stated. Hey, guys. You can enjoy your sin and still go to heaven. You want to go out there and sleep around. You want to go out there and do drugs. You want to be a thief. You can, there's, theoretically speaking, if you're sincere about asking forgiveness of God, you can still do that. It's lawful. You can do that. It's not like God can't forgive your sin. But you understand it ain't going to be no good for your life. Do you know how many times I sit in that office with Christian husbands, Christian wives, Christian couples, Christian children, and they believe in God, but they don't, they want to do their own thing. Well, how's that working for you? So you're telling me just because I sleep with women and I'm a woman, I'm going to hell? No. What I'm telling you is you're going to be unhappy. Why? Why do you believe in God? Because the Bible is true. And the Bible is true. Don't lust after somebody of the same gender. Why? Why? That's not fair. I don't know. Take it up with God, guys. I, I don't have all the answers. Why not? I, I don't. Why is it bad? We're on the way home, and some dude cut me right. I had my blinker on, right? I got my blinker on, and I'm moving over. This turd rushes up behind, behind me. And while I move over, beep, swerves out of the way. The guy next to me swerved. Like, you know, you know what that guy needs? He needs me to follow him to the next exit, pull him out of his truck, and smack the crap out of him. It would be so much, everything in the world would make sense if I did that. But God says, bless those who curse you. Pray for those who despitefully use you. That's not what I feel like doing. That's not what I felt like doing at all. As a matter of fact, you know what that guy also did? He got me in a fight with my wife. Because she's like, honey, relax. I'm like, I'm not going to relax. This guy just drove up on me. It's like, you're road raging. This isn't road rage. I'll show you road rage, woman. Are you laughing because you've had that same conversation or are you just laughing at me? Okay. You had the same one. Are you the road rager though or is he the road rager? You? He used to be. I'm doing better. Okay. I won't tell anybody. See all things you can do. Now if I get out of the car and smack the crap out of that dude and, and which he deserved completely, would God say, oh that's it, you're not going to heaven now. You're done. No. Things are lawful for me, but just because you can doesn't mean you should. Why? It ain't good. You're doing the wrong thing. 
Man, this life is so difficult. I, this is one of the hard things. Isn't this supposed to be easy? Isn't Christianity supposed to be, you come, accept the Lord as your Savior, we all sing kumbaya, my bank account swells, my wife never cheats on me, I never cheat on her. We never fight. My kids all walk with the Lord. My grandchildren love me. I mean, isn't that what Christianity is? How come nobody's saying yeah? Yeah. Because it ain't. Look at, um, where are we at? 24? Let no one seek his own, but each one the other's well-being. The whole chapter. That's the key to it. That should be the highlight of this chapter. Let no one seek his own, but each one the other's well-being. Now, listen to what he says here through the end. From here through the end of the chapter is very interesting. And I want you to try to think about having this as an example and how you would apply it to your life. I came up with a couple of examples in my brain, but I want to see what you can come up with. Listen to what he says here. If any of those who do not believe invite you to dinner, I'm sorry, go back, go back, go back. Verse 25, eat whatever is sold in the meat market, asking no question for conscience sake. For the earth is the Lord's and all its fullness. If any of those who do not believe invite you to dinner and you desire to go, eat whatever is set before you, asking no question for conscience sake. But if anyone says to you, this was offered to idols, do not eat it for the sake of the one who told you and for conscience sake. For the earth is the Lord's and all its fullness. Conscience, I say not your own, but that of the other. For why is my liberty judged by another man's conscience? But if I partake with thanks, why am I evil spoken of for the food over which I gave thanks or give thanks? Therefore, whatever you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Give no offense either to the Jews or to the Greeks or to the church of God, just as I also please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many that they may be saved. Now, let me explain to you, and then we're going to finish. Back then, in the city of Corinth, there were all these temples. It, there was multiple religions, and all of them did this animal sacrifice. So what they would do is they'd take a cow in the temple Diana, and they'd offer a sacrifice to this god, and then they'd take the meat and they'd sell it in the market. This is when you go to the market, don't ask. It was like a Bill Clinton, don't ask, don't tell. Hey, was that sacrifice done? You know what God says? You know what an idol is? You know what he just said? An idol's nothing. There's nothing stronger than God. If they have meat in the market, buy it. Bring it home. Give thanks to God. Eat it. But if somebody says to you, you sure you want that? Because that was sacrificed to Zeus. Now, who is Zeus? Let's see. Let's put this on a scale. Zeus? Yahweh. Come on. Yahweh. He's God. Zeus? He's make-believe. <gasps> did you just say somebody else's God was make-believe? I absolutely did. And I mean it, too. But don't not eat that because of your conscience, because you know God's greater. He says, but don't eat it for the other. Oh, is that Zeus? Okay, well, I'll pass on. Do you have one that's not been sacrificed to the temple? You're not doing it for your own conscience sake. Do it for the other dude. Now, again, here's how I applied this to my life. I've been faithful to my wife now for more than 25 years. I've never struggled with pornography. Some of you guys heard that story before. Briefly, my father was in the pornography industry, and I was just a little kid, and he used to bring these girls that were in these movies over my house, and they were like sisters to me. And when I got old enough, when I was 12, 13 years old, I saw one of them in a movie my brother was watching. I had an older brother, and he was watching, and I flipped out. Because here is this girl who I considered like my sister. He was, I'm watching her have sex with like three guys. I flipped out. Never watched porn after that. Hate it. Disgusting to me. That's people having sex with my sister. Yeah, couldn't do it. Thank you, God. God did great work. I, so, but here's the thing. Sometimes you watch YouTube videos and they got girls in bikinis and, and you know, these fail videos and, and I think they're the funniest thing in the world. Now, if I'm watching them and I'm laughing, I'm going to watch this. 
But now, if I show that to a brother who has struggled with pornography or has struggled with... Now, am I allowing my liberty to hurt him? Because I was looking for a way to apply this because remember we just read everything you read should be as an example for you to apply. What application? Because I go to Publix. I said to the meat guy, but was that sacrifice to Zeus? He was like, no, you're good. Okay, good. Of course not. We don't have that. So how do we take now their experience and apply it to our life? I mean, and the, and the end of it is just going back to that same verse 25 is this. And just think of other people before yourself. The way up is down. The way down is up. The lower you think of yourself and the more you think of others, the happier you'll be. The less you think about getting yours, the more happy you'll be. You know what I'm saying? And this is crazy and it doesn't make any sense. So anybody, can anybody think of an, another application, something like that? I mean, a sacrifice to an idol. Just a weird thing. But if you boil it down, you reduce it to the lowest common denominator. It's just like, look, if the guy cuts you off on the road, wave to him. And when he tells you you're number one, thank you. I shouldn't have tried to change lanes. That was my fault. I was just trying to get home. However, whatever. Does it make sense to anybody? A little different. You see how he differently... Again, same exact message just two weeks ago. Just a little different flavor he adds to it. He uses examples of the Old Testament, and he makes it like just chill. Does this make sense to anybody yet? Is the light not gone on for some of you all? Because maybe you were like me, and everything was about you. What can you get, and how can you get? And, and take, 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 take. Here he just says, Give no offense either to the Jews or the Greeks or to the church of God, just as I also please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. Close your Bible. Last thought. So basically, tell me this. The Apostle Paul is right here telling us we should all be doormats, right? Let everybody walk on us, right? Just be a doormat for everybody. And if they want to put you down, let them put you down. If they want to step on you, let them step on you. You're just a doormat, right? Yep. You're a doormat to the gate of heaven. Let him step on you on the way into the gate of heaven. What a different way to look at it. So you're saying if they step on me and they step into heaven, is that worth it now? Yeah, you know what? I got home safe, you know what I mean? I didn't... <laughs> that girl probably didn't even really... She just probably wanted me to move to bed. <laughs> Thanks, Mickey. I appreciate that. Mickey looked at me. She went, probably. I saw you. Probably. I still got it. No, you don't. So, I think we're done. <laughs> Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for your word and the instruction of your word today, God. God, this is, um, this is a hard saying. Who could know it? To count others before ourselves is difficult. So give us the strength to accomplish that. And let us see the good that is done. And God, I do pray for the, the people that are here, that those that have understood this message, God, I thank you for them, and I ask you that you to give them strength to live it out, but I pray for those few that are here that don't get this message, and they don't agree with this message at all. Hey guys, before I say, before I close, I just, uh, I sense a feeling of spirit that there might be somebody here that might want to give their lives to the Lord, that they've never, they never opened their heart completely to the Lord. Or that they've been through a, a tough place and, and they want to rededicate their lives to the Lord. Let me explain to you. When the question is asked, why do you believe in God? I believe in God because when I did my thing, it turned out terrible. And when I did God's thing, 
It turned out terrible, and yet I was happy. <laughs> I don't understand it. It doesn't make any sense to me. And that's why I believe in God. If you're here and you've never been forgiven of your sins, you don't know what it's like not to have this burden, this weight on your shoulder, this anchor weighing you down. The Bible says if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God hath raised him for the dead, you'll be saved. If you're here and you've never understood the power of God's forgiveness, that you have this spiritual crud all over you, and the only one that could clean it is Christ Jesus. And, and then after you've been cleaned, there's this sense of immortality, this sense of purpose, this sense that you don't have to follow every feeling, that you're going to get stronger. And when you need to say no to things that you're going to have that ability. Yeah. If you're here and you want some of that, as Christ stood on a cross and died for us, he's asking you only to stand and live for him. He died for you, and he's asking you to live for him. If you are here and you want to receive Christ as your, your Savior, I will lead you in a prayer that will help you, that will just open your heart to the understanding of what you're doing. So stand up if you wish to accept Christ as your Savior in front of all these people. Is anybody here? I don't care if there's one or none. I just want to give you the opportunity for anybody here to stand up and receive in your heart Christ. Christians be praying. There's a, there's a battle going on right now. If you're sitting here and you're thinking to yourself, I'd be a gigantic hypocrite if I stood up right now. You have no idea what I'm doing with my life. That's all right. The church is full of hypocrites. You'll just be another one amongst people that love you. Don't be afraid. you're staying seated and you want to accept Christ as your Savior, there is no magic trick. Just open your heart. Just say to God, God, I love you. I need you. Help me. It's that simple. I'm glad to know that everybody in here is saved and everybody in here loves the Lord and knows the Lord. That's a major good thing. But I don't ever want to stop offering people the opportunity to surrender their heart because I don't know when tomorrow ends. I don't know when you don't have it tomorrow. There's a story in the newspaper yesterday, in the newspaper, on, online yesterday about a, a truck, a, a pickup truck. He ran into 10 bikers, seven dead, three in the hospital. When they took that road, they didn't know that was gonna be their last ride. And I wanna be bold enough to say, you don't know when your time is up. And if you've not, your road's not secure until you open your heart, guys. So keep that in mind. <clears throat> Drew, come up here and play a song. Let's worship God together. As you're walking up here, think about a song. Think about it. Think about it. Channeling one.
the splendor of the King, clothed in majesty, let all the earth rejoice, let all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, and darkness tries to hide. Trembles at his voice, trembles at his voice. How great our God, sing with me. How great our God, oh, we'll see how great, how great is our God. On your feet, church. Age to age she stands, and time is in his hands. Beginning and the end, beginning and the end. The Godhead three in one. Father, Spirit. Lion and the Lamb, Lion and the Lamb, how great is our God, sing with me, how great is our God, and oh, we'll see how great, how great is our God, name above all. You're the name above all names, worthy of all praise. My heart will sing, how great is our God. Name above all. You're the name above all Of all praise, my heart will sing how great is our God, and how great is our God. Sing with me, how great is our God. Oh, we'll see how great, how great is our God. Amen, church.